Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it is that time. It's time for another episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success, the things that drive us and inspire us. Like all the episodes, this one has been a long time coming. We have tons of mutual friends. Today's guest hailing from Rochester, but calling Miami home for the last several decades. In fact, Billboard magazine calls him the city's most in-demand drummer. He's won a Grammy, seven Latin Grammys, and he's worked with some slackers like Barbara Streisand, Madonna, Backstreet Boys, Kelly Clarkson, Pink, Nelly Furtado, Clay Aiken, Christina Aguilera, Michael Bolton, Ricky Martin. The list goes on and on. Talking about our friend Lee Levin. What's up, bud? What's happening, Rich? All good with you? Yeah, man. It's this is long overdue because we have our mutual friend Carlos Guzman, who's been like, you guys got to connect. So I'm yes. so happy we're making it happen. Well, I don't know if you remember. We did connect in Nashville. What? Um, It was, uh, was it like a Sessions thing? Sessions panel? Yeah, it was the Hal Blaine tribute yes. thing. And I actually gave you a ride home uh, to your house in Brentwood, I think you Oh, my lived, God. Did I have lived? too Maybe I had too many drinks. I think we all did, but I was driving, which is not good. Um, but yeah, so at, at that time, actually, I had a house in Franklin. I was splitting with my folks. So really, I, I went up there. I was staying. Yeah, I was staying in Franklin and we went to the Hal Blaine thing and uh, I gave you a ride home. Oh, my God. Well, thank you for getting me home safely. That is crazy. And I am sitting here looking at your if you guys are just listening to this, Lee sitting in front of this. Beautiful setup, tons of snare drums, a pro glistening pro tools, a gorgeous state of the art drum set, pasty cymbals, pasty pasty. And it's just uh is that uh I don't know what Miami houses, is. is that like a basement type situation? No basements in Florida. That's right, no, no basement. We are sea level, yeah. No, this uh was my garage. Oh, okay. So it, and uh as it turns out, I this particular model house that I bought has the it's the tallest house in the in the town that i live in so the garage actually had 10 and a half foot ceilings nice so i raised the floor everything is floating it, it was done by you know contractors and and studio people so i raised the floor and i have a foot of insulation at top so everything is soundproof but it doesn't feel like it's a tiny room because i had such a big garage that is great and that's really smart because i'm i'm in a reinvention period of my life where I might be shaking things up and I, I, I might do that same thing because I my studio crash studio is above the garage. It's the man cave thing, you know, the 600 square yeah. feet. But the garage is like an open reverberation chamber below. So it's like, gah, 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 you know, the neighbors are like, oh, my God. So the next house, I want to have a thing where it's just completely hermetically sealed. In Nashville, the first guy to do that, you guys might know each other, but Tony Mora has a place called the Downtown Battery. Yeah, I don't know him, but yeah, I, I, I know about him. Yeah, of course. He did the thing, man. He was like the first guy who was like, hey, I'm doing this. I want to be able to play 24-7 and not disturb the neighbors. And what a what a great luxury. man. Well, and, and down here, you know, basically it came about essentially just a need. Um, I was doing the sessions and um, I was I felt like I was missing out on a lot of demo work. Like Nashville, you guys have demos like writing demos and there are bands that literally play all day long and they'll do 10 demos if I, if that hasn't changed is that still happening yeah it's been affected just a little bit because of virtual instruments and great drum samples right. and all that yuck but right but um so i, I kind of felt like i was missing out on work and helping people out and artists or producers that i was songwriters that i was working with so i originally this whole thing was in a house uh, just in a regular, you know, guest bedroom or whatever. And this was 1994. You're very early adapter, man. Very early adapter. And I was recording on ADATS originally. And wow. then, I know, believe it or not. And then uh, the uh, Pro Tools 001 came out. So I switched to that. So I was limited to eight tracks. So I was summing the toms down to, you know, stereo pair and, and doing that. And I was just doing demos. And then just kind of out of the blue there was a, a a guy that said well hey it sounds pretty good can we do an album i'm like i, I guess i mean i you know i don't know i 
I've never done an album, you know, in my house like that. And then they just started coming. And it was one of those things that like from 94 until now I bought, I bought this house in 2002. So I've been in this studio for 20 years. Yeah. Tw 22 years. Yeah. yeah. 22 years. Cause my son is 22 years old. Yeah. Oh, what so, does your son do? Is he just getting out of college? Uh, he's or? Just about to graduate. Yep. He nice. uh, is in advertising marketing at university of South Florida in Tampa. Smart. And uh, I have him home for the summer. He's just finishing up a couple classes. And uh, yeah, good kid. He's like, Dad, hold it down now, down there. I'm, I'm having my friends over. <laughs> Funny you should mention that because his bedroom is right here. But I think, you know, he we moved in. He was like a couple months old. So I think he got used to it, just the noise, and, and he could sleep through anything. Is yeah, it a cool true. thing but, that Dad's a drummer? Or is it like, you know? Uh, I hope so. I mean, you know, I, I think when kids grow up around it, they don't really think about it mm -hmm. that much. You know, when, when, like, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I, I toured with Bad Bunny on, on one of his tours. And it's like, I, I thought he'd be like totally into it, whatever. And it seemed like, okay, whatever. But when he told his friends, all of a sudden it was like, your dad does what? Plays with Bad yeah. Bunny? You're kidding me. He, he's how old? What? <laughs> Those kinds of things. So, so yeah, I I think he you know he caught on a little bit with the friends. Yeah, that's killer. And so yeah, th so when when it was in a guest bedroom, you have to be a little bit more sensitive to the time. I can only record between ten and five, that kind of a thing. But when you've got that kind of setup, so that's kind of, that's my next um, next thing. I'm excited. What am I looking at? Like to flow to floor, like like twenty grand, something like that. What it costs nowadays, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, just the build out of this place at the time was probably, and, and that's for everything. So not just the floor was probably 25 grand. Yikes. It's going to be but a lot more everything. now. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the thing. And it's, it's floated. Like it's got the neoprene pads and the yeah. two by sixes. And there's, you know, there's uh, the do rock and all the, you know, all the thermofiber in between the slats on the floor. I mean, this thing is, I mean, it is solid. Yeah. But you also got to consider HVAC too, like air flow and all that. Kind yep. Of stuff. There's a whole new system in here that's just for the studio. Yeah. This I, I got this door over here. I don't, I don't know if you, this yeah, door. Right. Uh -huh. That that's a 400 pound. Uh, it's got a, a lead in between the wood. You know, like like a studio door. Because just on the other side of that is about six feet of the garage left, just for some storage, and then it's outside. Yeah, and then your neighbors are like, "Hey, um, but you ha you had a crystal ball because you know you and I are about the same age. You're, we go to a traditional. You, you're a University of Miami guy. I'm a University Texas Tech University North Texas guy. We get out into the real world. We're doing the thing. We're doing everything we can do to get traditional session work. And then, and then you make that jump to Cartage. Somebody's setting up my drums. Yeah, I could just drink my coffee. Um, but you had to see to your see the future. Like, hey, this is uh, this Napster thing, and then boom, and then this has been affected, and studios are closing. You know, it was one of those things that I, I didn't really think about it that way long term. It wasn't this grand plan. It just kind of happened and and literally was was I, I just to record some demos for people or whatever and, and get a couple hundred bucks here or there. And it turned into doing records. So it wasn't I mean, yeah, I was an early adopter, but it was I didn't have this grand plan. And at that time, it's really weird because a lot of musicians in South Florida started to do that. And at one time. Uh, and I don't think it was even called Avid at the time. Pro Tools were like, you know, Miami per capita has more Pro Tools systems than anywhere else in the country. Really? Because we were we were all doing it. Yeah. Yeah, early. Because we didn't have access to all the studios. I mean, Criteria is here, which is great. And there were a number of other studios at the time. But, you know, you know how it is. I mean, you, you someone's got to bring your stuff or you got to bring it yourself. And then there's, you know, there's an hour of setup and an hour of sound check. And then, you know, someone's late. And then, you know, so, you know, your one song session turns into six hours. And it's like, yeah. where'd my day go? <laughs> I know. And, but but 25 years ago, we were so excited. To, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, my God, I got my oh, three yeah. snare drums. I got my crack. I got my mid. I got my... I got my selection of symbols. Let's. I got my gaff tape. Let's pour the coffee. This is amazing. Yes. Yeah. No doubt. And and I miss it. I miss. I miss the sessions. I miss the interaction. Yeah. Um. I mean, some of the best, you know, musical experiences I ever had were, you know, I can pinpoint them on, you know, maybe two hands, you know. And it's not that 
you know, all the sessions that I've been able to play on and all those things aren't great, but there are a couple that just stand out and you're like, wow, that was an amazing experience and, and probably could never be replicated again. Okay. So why we bring that up? Let's, what is that? You want to share those with us? Um, well, there, you know, it's funny. There's an artist and, and sadly she passed away. Her, she was a Colombian artist named Soraya. And two of those experiences with, were with her different producers. Um, and just such a great songwriter and, and everything was coming from the heart and we all played together and the songs were amazing and the vibe was great. And it's just one of those things that just comes together. You don't know how you couldn't replicate it again. And, and, you know, those, those sessions stick in my head as being, you know, an amazing experience. Those kind of pinch me moments. And that, and that's fantastic. Cause I was boning up a little, doing a little bit of research on you and, you know, congratulations, man. A year ago, CBS Miami had a nice feature. The uh, uh, They did a nice feature on you, man. It was long, and it was highlighted your career as a musician. Very cool. Yeah, that was, uh, that was it. well, inside story. The, uh, the person that produced that I actually went to high school with. But it came about because the high school, actually, they had this, they have this Hall of Fame yeah. sort of thing. And for whatever reason, my high school, I don't know if it's something in the water, my high school has some pretty interesting people that have graduated from it. Um, I don't put myself in that category. I li literally thought, you know, um, guys, I play drums. I, I don't know if I belong on this list, but literally Jeff Bezos. Wow. From Amazon graduated the same year my brother did. Wow. Um, the, Supreme, the newest Supreme Court Justice, uh, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. Okay. She graduated a little after, so she's a little younger than me. So she graduated a number of football, uh, basketball players, baseball players. So there's like, I, I don't know what it is, crazy people. Yeah. Well, you I know. mean, the thing is, is you say, oh, I don't belong in this category. Oh, shucks, because I'm a drummer. But I mean, deep down, we know that we play more than just a musical instrument. We're changing lives, affecting people. It goes so deep, you know. I, I get that. But, I, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's music, you know, and it's not that music isn't important. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's just, you know, there are brain surgeons and stuff that, you know, you know, Supreme Court justices. That, that's pretty important. Amazon. That's a pretty big deal. I love know? the Amazon, man. You could publish a book. You can get toilet paper delivered to your house the same afternoon. Yeah. So Nuts. that that guy went to my high school. Very good. Well, congratulations with that, man. So there's so much to talk about. I have so many questions to ask you, but we could go down that, you know, our history, since we're a similar age, it really resonates in the fact that I know that you started with the pad at a very young age and you get the Ted Reed and you get the syncopation and you're playing along with records and t take us back. You don't have to spend too much time on it, but how, how that all started, like why the drums? How did your parents recognize, hey, this kid's uh, he's hitting everything? All right. So not a musical family. I mean, my mom has a great ear. My dad. Uh, no, not at all. And you still have both your parents? No, my, my father passed away a couple of years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I still have my mom. Thank you. I still have my mom. She's uh, 10 minutes. I just saw her this morning. Actually, she needed help with something. Um, she's 10 minutes away and she's got a great musical ear. They were both really supportive. Um, it was one of those things. And I don't even know how or why three, four years old, I was pulling pots and pans out from underneath the kitchen, you know, nice. cabinets and taking tinker toys and, you know, making, I guess they look like mallets to me. I don't know, drumsticks, whatever. And she would sit me in front of the, the stereo and I would bang on pots and pans, having no clue what I was doing whatsoever. Um, and after, I don't know, maybe a year or so of that, um, at five, she took me to a music school in Rochester. Uh, my teacher, great, great guy, great teacher, Alan Heberling was... Uh, I think a master student at the time at Eastman, you know, and Eastman John Beck a, and all know. that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. John Beck was there and uh, the whole nine yards and, and uh, she got me four lessons and, you know, again, pad, just pad. And I thought it was amazing. I didn't know that it was just a practice pad. I thought this was the greatest thing ever. Um, and then she got me four more and then got me four more and, you know, it just never stopped until I finished college. It was one of, you know, very traditional musical, you know, background. Yeah, me too. Lessons Same exact played, thing. Played, yeah, played in school bands, played yeah. in garage bands, you know, nothing, nothing special, you know, about that part of it. Yeah. Um, 
and my folks were super supportive and and my mom was always looking for opportunities of where I could you know pick up experiences and stuff and and um one that I'll share with you and not not to you know hog the conversation but um there was she saw that there was an audition for this big band that was sponsored by the police department it's called the Metro Dade Police Jazz Ensemble and it was mostly made up of officers that um you know, played instruments and some college kids and a couple high school kids. I was 13. I don't know what she was thinking, like having me audition, but I had already been playing for, you know, six, seven years already. Um, and she brought me down and I auditioned and there were two drummers. I got, you know, one person left. I got the gig awesome. and I started like playing big band stuff with like, you know, a big band. And there were some college kids and, and a lot of us, we actually still play together. There's a, a couple guys, you know, in town, great trombone player and trumpet players. And, and uh, one of my best friends in the world, who's the co-musical director with me on the Latin Grammys, Doug Emery, we met, he was also 13. So we were the two youngest guys in the band and we're still working together and still playing together and still That's doing stuff. And yeah, we're best friends. That is awesome. So is it like a dab, 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 that kind of exactly? Yeah. yeah, string of pearls and yeah, all that stuff. And and we would do gigs almost every weekend. That's really you know, cool. Two or three weekends. It's yeah. so young. And then this, the fact that you've cultivated these relationships, you're still doing it. That is amazing. So well, that brings up the idea of this uh, co-band leading musical directing the Latin Grammys. What are those responsibilities? You preparing charts, herding cats. Coming up with arrangements, all of the above, uh, and it changes every year. It depends on the artists. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've been doing this a number of years now, and I, you know, I've been involved in the recording academy and stuff like that for for a long time. Um, and it kind of morphed from doing the person of the year uh, into uh, more recently they've they've gone from um, just having every artist bringing their individual band or hiring a separate band for each artist. They decided actually at, I think it was the COVID. I think it was the COVID one, maybe the one before um, to get a house band. And, you know, we're not going to bring in as many people. We're just, you know, we're going to keep it tight and we know who's in, who's out. Um, and that really worked out and they, they loved it. They loved the idea and, and, you know, there are artists that bring their own bands and, and that's fine. You know, we get a break, but uh, we're usually on seven to eight segments. Um, Doug and I write the theme every year for the show. Nice. Um, yeah, which is awesome. So we get a few coins coming in on that. Um, you know, and, and like you said, it's it's arrangements. It's getting the band together. It's doing the rehearsals. It's making sure the artists are happy. It's walking into the truck and listening back to make sure everything is you know, is sounding good. And, and, you know, we're doing stuff with playback and click and, and all kinds of things as well. But so the band's on top of that. And you, you know, you have to yeah. make sure that the vision that we've been working on for two months before the show actually is coming across for the live broadcast. Cause you only get one shot at doing it. Yeah. yeah. And that, well, that's really great that there's that much live musicianship on that particular show because the Grammy Grammys, is uh, tell me if I'm wrong or if I'm being the get off my lawn guy, but there's way more um, canned tracks and dancers. Well, I, I think the Latin Grammys is like that as well. However, um, the executive producer who I've known for a very long time, Jose Tian, he loves live music. He's a bass player. We were in like, you know, garage bands in high school, you know, playing, you know, those kinds of things. And, and, so he wants as much live as possible. And, you know, certain musical styles, it's just not going to be that way. And that's fine. And we all get it. But if it can be live or it can be some sort of, you know, mashup with live and, and track or whatever, he loves doing that stuff. So um, it's given us an opportunity to kind of, you know, experiment here and there and take guys that are reggaeton artists and do something completely rock and roll with them. And they love the energy. They're not used to feeling a band behind them. Yes. So all of a sudden they get like the air is moving and the and the amps are making noise and you know and and you hit something and it makes a noise and they get they get excited about that. It's real. Like air is moving. It's not a, it's not exactly. an MP3. Yeah. 
Amazing. Exactly. Well, well, congratulations on that. That's got to be something to look forward to every year. And you tell us about the Bad Bunny thing. You had you not toured in a while because I, I there's videos of you playing with the Bee Gees. There's there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. So early on, I I decided. Well, actually, right when I got married, I decided I really didn't want to tour that much. I, I wanted. I loved the studio thing. I always wanted to be a studio drummer. Um, you know, the, the live thing's great, but it's hard to do both. It is. Yeah. Um, and, and at the time there was, you know, there was enough work in, in Miami that, you know, I could focus on just doing the studio stuff. And, um, so I, I really did focus on that and did a cup, you know, I would do some live shows and things here and there, but th I was never doing a steady thing. I did Ricky Martin, like in, uh, 2002 or 2003, but then, you know, not did the Barry stuff, um, Barry Gibb. We we did a number of things, but you know, they would be a month at a time, or you know, or or a couple weekends here or there. Those those sort of things, and those are great. Like I love that. Um, but the the steady, you know, uh, getting on and off a bus, um, you know, that was I hadn't done that in a long time. We had a blast. It was you know, I was the musical director, so you know, I got four guys that you know I love. Actually, four guys that are in the Latin Grammy house band. And uh, we did three months, a little more than three months with, with Bunny touring around the States and Canada doing, you know, arena shows. And it was a, a freaking blast. I, I, I saw the videos of you, you guys, like the, the band is on the floor and he's got a giant section in the middle. Yeah. So interesting story about that. The band was, was sort of an afterthought. He'd never worked with a band really before. Crazy. So this, the design of the stage that album had this um, this big 18 wheeler truck on the front of it. So the, before he even ever added a band or thought about a band, the design of the, the stage was this truck was going to literally drive out into the middle of the arena. Cause it was in the round yeah. and the, and the, and the panels of the truck open up and become the stage. Yeah. Well, where are you going to put the band? So yeah, we ended up kind of on the floor cause that was the only place that, that they could put us and that particular album had a lot of um you know for him a lot of guitars and some drum sample things and stuff like that so and he really wanted to up the game so we took some stuff that was you know very you know reggaeton or, or trip hop and that kind of thing and you know he's like no i want this to sound like nirvana I'm like, great so <laughs> you know we ch we changed some of the arrangements and 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 do that and you know, I, I think we did like eight to 10 songs on the tour. And then it was another two hours of DJ. Oh, wow. So we were done in 40, that's, that, 45 that's, minutes. That's easy living, man. And and you're brave enough. There's some videos floating around there of your in-air mix with a click and you doing the whole thing. And, and there's what's really interesting is that I know in a lot of music making, there's these guide tracks like chorus two, three, right. which really right. helps if you don't speak the language. Right. Because he sings in Spanish. Right. right? But you speak right. Spanish, right? Yeah, no, I speak enough. And that that was more because things were put together so quickly because, again, the whole thing with the band was was sort of like, I think I want a band. You know, it was like all of a sudden it's like we had to put all of this together really quickly. And it was, you know, nobody wanted to be reading anything. And it was more of let's just make sure we don't screw this up. Um, you know, so putting those things in, you know, because there were a couple points where the guitar and bass player who were, you know, free from, you know, having to sit behind anything like I was, um, you know, would run up on stage and they do something. And, you know, when you're doing that, you know, you're not really thinking about, Oh, is the chorus coming up this time? Or is there an extra bar here or whatever? Yeah. I can see that being so, helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So we put those guides on it and, and, you know, you don't need them after a while, but you know, yeah. it's too lazy to take them off. That's cool. Like, well, you know, for the early days in us, I mean, I've been playing the same band. Oh my God, I can't believe it. 25 years. But uh, Jason would always come to soundcheck when we were doing clubs and theaters and things like that. And then, you know, he gets busy. He's got to do press or whatever. Next thing you know, your artist is never at soundcheck. The band's just checking our thing. And we would have to remember, we would have to remember the, all the arrangements without the vocal. And on some tunes, it can yeah. kind of pr tricky, but now with all the technology, we have a track of him singing. So it's just so much easier. Right. Just it's, technology really can help things it could also be the detriment it, of the world like minority report you know but but uh yeah <laughs> yeah no and and you know he he wasn't used to coming to soundcheck at all so he almost never came to soundcheck 
So, you know, we would sound check without them and, you know, we'd run through three or four songs, make sure everything was fine. And then, you know, we'd, we'd be sitting around and, and the, the crew guys would start calling out tunes and, you know, we'd be doing Journey, we'd be doing, you know, Nirvana this or Foo Fighters that or whatever. And it would be try and stump the band, you know, to see if we knew the song. Most of them we didn't know at all, but it was it was fun trying anyway. But yeah, he he wouldn't come to soundcheck. The first time we'd see him for the day was literally when that thing went, and he would you know pop out of the top. Amazing, amazing, yeah, crazy. I love the fact that you just said I am going to focus on this, and it's a build it, they will come kind of a thing. You know, um, you probably had guys that you modeled your career after. For me, it's probably no uh, no secret. I really admired uh, Aronoff's business model. Hey, re- record in multiple cities, tour on multiple genres. And in every spare moment, do clinics. And I was like, I'm going to do that ex- exact thing. But it would get painful sometimes when, you know, there's that Nashville television show and you get a call for three of the artists are doing solo records from the Nashville. And you're like, ah, I'm in Des Moines. I can't do it. You know, but big picture, my model has been have the steady job and then fill everything in where you were just you made a conscious decision. I'm married. I'm going to have children. I got this a great great my i've got this great reputation i got this place to record i'm going to focus on that and it has worked out great it it worked out and and you know it's my my hero growing up was you know steve gadd although you know i've got so many and most of them are studio drummers i mean jim keldner and jr and carlos vega and jeff picard i mean go down the list Mm that you know hal blaine i mean my god you know russ kunkel there's so many and all the ones that i loved were the session guys not yeah. that i didn't love the other guys but but there was something about like i just love songs and i've always loved songs i'm not necessarily when i listen to stuff i don't you know focus on the drums or you know stuff like that i just love good music and and you know so that was always what i wanted to do and my my plan after after school was to move to la i mean everything was being done in la i graduated I did a double major, so I had a music business major along with the the uh, they called it studio music and jazz at the time. We didn't do a whole lot of studio stuff, mm-hmm. and I jazz was not my favorite. I mean, I can I can fake my way through it. I you know I know all the stuff, whatever, but it wasn't my passion. And it, you know, I I grew up you know pretending I was in Earth, Wind, and Fire. I could you know I, I did not pretend I was in Miles Davis band. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I always just wanted the groove and the funk and the backbeat and the whole nine yards. And so that's what I focused on. Um, you know, I think that's why I fell in love with the with the session guys. Um, so so to me, that's what I always wanted to do. And and after I graduated, it was like, oh, I'll, I'll move to L.A. And, and that's what I'm going to pursue. Saw like literally the week I graduated or, or a couple of weeks after saw an audition for a Latin artist named Cheyenne. Yeah. Um, who's still doing it, still touring. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. He was he was a heartthrob from a like a menudo type group, in Puerto Rican. Had the flowing um, locks. Uh, actually, no, he didn't oh. have flowing locks, but he, <laughs> he's a he, he's a good looking fella, no yeah, question yeah. about it. <laughs> um, and uh, I auditioned for that, got the gig, went on tour for like a year and a half with him. You know, South America, Mexico, the States, and, you know, we weren't home for six months, you know, stuff like that. It was, it was nuts. And at a time where it was, you know, difficult, especially down in some of the Latin American countries, they, you know, I, I could tell you stories that, you know, literally they were trying, they were trying to uh, uh, jumpstart a plane with a car battery. I have pictures of it. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't care if it starts, I'm not getting on that plane. That, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, that doesn't make sense. Don't do that. Wow. Yeah. It, luckily, it didn't start, so I didn't have to, you know, make a big deal out of it. But so, you know, that that the plan was to move. I ended up doing that tour. And literally a couple weeks after I got back and was thinking about, OK, I, I got to do this. I got to do that in order to move. I got called for a session from someone that I had met while I was at this music festival down in Chile. So I did that session and then I got called for another session. I got called for another session. And then it was like, OK, well, I, I want to move to L.A., but. I might as well get this experience and then move to LA. I'll have a discography of, you know, five or six albums or whatever I could get. I'll have stuff that I can play for producer or whatever and and have some experience. So I'm not just, you know, knocking on doors and saying, I want to be a studio musician. I can go and say, I am a studio musician, even if it's green as can be. Perfect. Um, And it just, 
it just never stopped. You know, I was, I was so fortunate and blessed that the calls kept coming in and, and I thought, well, I don't really care if it's not my original language. I'm doing what I want to do. It's, it's pop, it's rock. I was learning the Latin stuff and, and having a blast with that. Um, and especially at that time in the, in the like early nineties, mid nineties, the Latin market wanted everything to sound American. So the fact that I was a gringo was like, they loved that. Yeah. Like, get the gringos. So, you know, we had gringo guitar players and gringo drummers because they were like, how do we get that sound of the American market? That's, That's what amazing. They were well, that, that worked out awesome. Wasn't that, yeah, wasn't really um, Julio's gig kind of like a rite of passage for everyone? Or was it Enrique's gig that was the rite of passage? No, it was, it was Julio's gig. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think and like Van Romaine's been playing with Enrique since like almost since the beginning right if i'm not mistaken yeah um yeah julio's gig was a rite of passage and that was a whole um that was a very interesting how that whole thing came about i can i can tell you if you're interested yeah because like didn't um, didn't brendan buckley work with him too because brent yep brendan uh did it after i did it um yeah a lot of a lot of guys went through that particular camp um so my story is a, a little different than some of the other guys so I actually first started working with Julio in the studio. Um, he had been working on a record and he had done most of it, I think, in Nashville, if I'm not mistaken. And he was down here. He lives down here and wanted to – he's famous for wanting to redo and try again. And, you know, this thing isn't quite right and I'm not feeling it. So um, I was called in to do a couple of songs like that. And, and, and that's how we first started working together. Um, but one of the very first things I did was he decided at one point that he was going to redo like 50 of his biggest hits um, from scratch. Whoa. And again, yeah. And again, had had gone to LA, had gone to Nashville, done a bunch of stuff. And, you know, in Julio fashion, who I still love dearly, he's a, he's a great guy, so I'm not ragging on him. He wanted to try some other things and redo this and this groove isn't right for me and, you know, whatever it was doing. And they, I get called in one day and, and I'm in criteria and Julio Iglesias, the producer and the engineer, and, and we're sitting there and he plays me this track. He says, I want to redo the drums. I'm like, okay. And I'm listening to it and it sounds unbelievable. Like, I don't know who it is. I don't know what it is. And I can't find anything wrong with it whatsoever. It's like, what am I going to do to this? You know, I don't know what he's not telling me what he doesn't like. He just, I don't like it. And I lean over to the engineer. I'm like, who's who played the drums? He's like, oh, that's Carlos Vega. I'm like, what's wrong with it? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, do you have a copy? Because it was two inch tape. I'm like, do you have a copy of it? Like, I, I don't want you to erase Carlos Vega's drum tracks. Like, just don't do it. Don't he's like, do yeah, that. we have back. Yeah, we have backups on everything. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll go in and do whatever you want to do, but don't erase that. Yeah. And I and thought he may have wanted to recut the 50 songs, maybe like a like a Taylor Swift thing to own the publishing. Something weird got weird there, you know. I don't think so. I think it was more, you know, it, as you know, he started in, in the late 60s, early 70s, and I think as time went on, you know, it, sonically these things didn't sound great to him, and. And, you know, he wanted to change things, whether it was tempos or, you know, pitch of the orchestra and, you know, in Spain in the seven, you know, in 72 or whatever. And, thing, you know, things didn't sound the way he wanted them to sound. And, and that's really important to him. Yeah. So I think that was part of it. I don't think it was the Taylor Swift thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. Oh, yeah. So so that was uh, that was part of your your journey. And then you're touring right away with Cheyenne. And you're like, oh, my God, the work is just trickling in. So. You know, this the dream of going to Southern California was like, I got all the work I need here. We got palm trees. The weather's great. You know, it it was it was part of that. It was it was um, I, I just didn't have a need to leave. And I, and I felt at, at a certain point, it was really difficult to think about uprooting what I was already building. Um, you know, and again, I, I started recording at home or a home studio in 94. Yeah. I was still, that was when I started touring with Julio. So I was already starting to do that stuff. And, and as I, I would come back and my stuff was already set up because I was using a kit, you know, on Julio's thing. So I'd come back, everything was mic'd and ready to go. So even if we were going out on the weekend or I was coming back for two days, I could still record something and then go back out on the road. And it was just, 
it was it was awesome. Yeah, you know, no. just didn't stop. I love satisfying both sides of the soul. Where you're like, you are uh, executing a live show in front of a lot of screaming, sweaty people, and then you can come home in the four walls and turn on the click and make someone else's dream come true. It's really a great thing. And dress like this. I love it. What's yeah. Kane's? Is that Kane's ballroom or Kane's? Uh, the Miami Hurricanes, baby. Oh, those Kane's. You could tell I'm a real sportsitarian. Uh, that, sorry, that, I'm I'm a home I'm a homer. So. Is that is that is that one of your your hobby sports and going to the well, games ever? I, I love I love Hurricanes football. I love college football. And you know, at the time that I went to University of Miami, I mean, we had you know four or five national championships right around the time that I went there. I mean, I was there for two or three of them, yeah. and it was just I mean the the Hurricanes were bigger than the Dolphins, and it, so it was like you know the, these. This this was where I grew up and, and learned to love football and and you know I would I would see these guys on campus and you know I'm five foot three so these guys were enormous um, so yeah drummers, I just fell drummers are bit. short man if a drummer gets above like five nine I get nervous it's like you're not supposed to be tall I get skeptical I mean like, like Chad Smith yeah. pulls it off you know but the rest of us are like uh, floor huggers man you know that's it that's <laughs> it man you know I'm I'm like well it's funny because one of See this uh, this drum right here? Is like a, is that like a wide open bass drum or something? Uh, uh, well, it's not at the moment, but it's actually got two heads on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is a twenty eight inch nineteen seventy one Ludwig. So Look very 14... small behind that. Wait, there's two. So I, I bought the kit, and there's two double bass twenty eight by fourteen. Oh I'm five God. three. Do you think my legs, like, you know how far apart you have to put two twenty eight? inch bass drums to play double bass drum Whoa. not that i even play double bass drum but my legs won't reach it so i i've got two separate ones now oh my god crazy yeah, yeah. so yeah no. short short guys yeah and so part do you set up a little higher because like my thing is like people are like why don't you just help yourself kid and like set up higher so we could see you above the tom it, it, it everyone's always complaining mostly my mother but yeah everybody i can't see you um you know i at the time that I started, I was sitting really low, like the Vinny thing in the, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, like, yeah. oh, and, and the symbols just about as high as they could go. And, you know, that's changed over the years. I've come a little higher. The symbols have definitely come down a lot more. Yep. Um, but you know, it's, it's whatever is comfortable for, for what I'm doing. I, I don't, I, I try not to change stuff, but I, I find once in a while you change something you're like, oh, wow, this is. I've got a whole new idea of something that's happening because I I'm sitting on top of the drums now instead of sort of driving behind them. That's true. No, it's, and, and I know I have to really, it really gets weird for me when I put an eight inch snare drum on because it, it just raises everything. And now it's like, Oh my God, now this, the relationships between all the drums are off, you know? Right. I just got a really low snare stand. Oh, man, it's a great idea. Maybe uh, maybe DW makes an extra, extra, extra low snare. How long have you been with Pearl, man? They're in Music City here. You ever get over here to talk to the guys? I have been up there. Yeah, I have been up there. Um, I've been with Pearl. Oh, wow. Um, a long time. And I can't remember exactly when I switched. I was I was originally with Noble and Cooley. Ah, man. Um, great drums. Which, which love their drums. Still have, you know, I still have uh, a kit. I still have a number of the snare drums. Um, but it it became hard to get servicing. Oh, sure. You know, you you do a TV show and there wasn't a kit within you know four hundred miles of of New York City or you know or or the one or two kits that were there you know were other endorsers and they were using it and so sadly I you know I I had to look elsewhere and I've been super happy with Pearl. Um, not to make it a you know a Pearl advertisement, but their I mean, hardware is amazing. You're gonna find drums Pearl drums. Amazing. Yeah, you're gonna find them as backline kits. Oh, and and in some ways, my very first like professional kit was a Pearl kit. It was the Ed Shaughnessy model. It was wood fiberglass, nineteen seventy. Oh, wow. What was it? Nineteen seventy four or five or six? Yeah. I don't know. Something like that. It had to be before we moved to Florida. So yeah, seventy four, seventy five, and um, I still have it. Um, and it, it's a great kit. So I so when I you know went with Pearl, it was almost like coming back home, which was cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, and just from, pasty, from a like soul standpoint. 30 years or something yeah. pasty. Yeah. Yeah. Since, since Julio days. 
Yeah, I literally, I, I wrote a letter, I you know, to Rich Mangicaro. I don't know if you, Rich, you remember yeah, Rich. Yeah. yeah, love Rich. And and I, I wrote a letter. I said, listen, I love your symbols. I'm going to buy them if you don't give me an endorsement. So, you know, whatever. I'm still going to use them. I'm not looking for just free stuff. I'm looking for these things. And if you can help me, that's great. Um, and uh, they helped me out. And they've still been helping me out. And they're just awesome. Well, that's always the angle they're looking for. I'm going to play these no matter what. I'm just letting you know that I'm playing these. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that that's just the fact. You know, I'm not going to endorse something that I'm not happy with. Right. Just not going to do it. No, no, yeah. no, no. And are you like a 5A guy or a 5B guy? I'm exactly a 5A guy. 5A yeah. guy, yeah. I can see, I can no, see but- that. To me, it's just a little bit. I have to get a little bit animalistic with Jason, so it seems like the 5B is more a better all-around choice. But sometimes I get those 5As, and I'm like, Ooh, this, is, this feels good, man. Yeah. Well, I, there was when I was out with Cheyenne, I actually got tendonitis. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and I was using heavier sticks, and, and I think that was one of the things that made me back off and, instead of having something so heavy. And, you know, it's almost counterintuitive. You think, oh, a heavier stick, you're not going to have to hit this hard. But you know what it's like when you're on the, when you're playing live and there's, you know, 15,000 people in your stadium or whatever, it, you're going to hit hard no matter what. It doesn't matter what sticks you have in your hands. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I switched to the five A's and, and I still pound in the studio. You know, I, you, you know this. I mean, part of being a studio drummer is to translate that energy onto the track. And there's no one here. Like I have to I have to have a great imagination and sometimes I'm the first one to go. So it's like there could be just a reference acoustic and it's like, okay, yeah, this is gonna be a total foo fighter song. I'm like, oh, okay. And I have to play like that and I'm playing to an acoustic guitar. Because you have to envision the layers of guitars and things that are gonna be on it. That's yes. that. That's a great word, imagination, and that has come up with some other drummers that I admire uh, in this world. Because when you have your home place, sometimes they're sending you, you know, everything is completely done and slammed to the grid, and there was a program drum part, and now you have to add the humanity, and they want it almost exactly like it. Okay, so that's one particular, and then the other time is the other where it's just a click, maybe a guide vocal, an acoustic guitar that may or not be tight with the click. So you say, hey. Are you going to keep this acoustic or do you want me to just bury the click or should I play with the acoustic to make it sound like we track together? So th- that is the thing, the imagination and asking the right questions and how much stuff is going to be on here. Do you want it dense? Do you want it? Who are some reference drummers? It's, it's fun. That's got to be fun. Yeah. That's exactly it. And you, you, you start to learn, you know, even if it's a new client by the things that they say, like, you know, I have enough experience with it now that, they say something and I'm like, okay, I know, you know, this person wants this type of thing or they want it really close to the reference drums that they sent yeah. or other people they are like, listen, you do your thing. I trust you, whatever. And it's not like the other people don't trust. It's, it's that that's their vision and that's their idea. Um, and especially I can tell, like if it's, something's been programmed, if it's really complicated, I'm going to keep it pretty much like what they did because they spent a lot of time doing it. I mean, I, I'll listen to it. I'm like, because I do programming, I'm like, I can't imagine how much time this took. I'm yes. not going to mess up what they did. You yeah, know, some and, and usually that's the case. Some of that stuff is, they make it intuitively easy, like on the machine or whatever, where it's like you want the trap hat stuff, and all you got to do is hold down. I mean, it's like, right. and, now we, and yeah. now we have to emulate this stuff. It's like, what are you doing? Are you doing a buzz roll? Are you doing a nine-stroke roll? No, I'm doing a 15-stroke. I mean, it's, right. it's it's just really weird where it's gone. But uh, the other question I was going to ask you was about, I know you're very involved with the uh, with the Grammys and the Recording Academy and, and advocating for musicians' rights. And you're finding yourself at Capitol Hill. Are you personally taking trips there to, to do some lobbying? And Yeah, I haven't done it in the last year or so. But um, yeah, I, I've done it for, you know, 10 or 12 years in a row. And, you know, it's it it's interesting, you know, I, I, I happen to be uh, a smaller government sort of guy, you know. Uh, I'm not going to put myself in a political camp because I, neither one of them I like. Neither yeah. the camps that are the popular ones, <laughs> but but I, I really think that you know, generally speaking, it's better if the government that you're dealing with is closest to the people. Sure. Um, except when you look when you actually read the Constitution, if you read Article One, Section Eight 
copyright is literally listed there. So it is the federal government's job to maintain and take care of copyright. So when things are off, that's the place to go. That's where we have to go if there's a copyright issue. If somebody is stealing music or, you know, or we've got issues with royalties, you know, whether it's, you know, performance royalties or songwriter royalties or producer royalties, whatever it is, that's their job. Copyright is the federal government's job. So, you know, we've gone for years and years and years to try and advocate for whatever seems to be the issue at the time. And, you know, it, it could be as simple as you remember when, when touring musicians weren't able to put their guitars in the overhead compartments on planes or right. things like that. Yeah. So that was one of the things we advocated for. It's like, no, these you can't tell a guy who's got a $6,000 guitar to stick it onto the plane. Hey, thank you, know, you for doing that. Because that, that need to happen. That needed to happen. That was a great job. I remember Dave Pomeroy, president of two five seven. You know, yep. share, sharing that information, and we're like, yes, amazing. I have a friend who's Kenny G's um, road manager, and a lot of times Kenny will say, "Look, I don't want to fly home with this, or I don't want. I don't want to have you take it. Hold on to the next time I see him." And he'll get on flights. Sometimes they're puddle jumpers, and they'll be giving him a hard time. He's like, "Look, it. I know this fits." You're just giving me a hard time. It is. This is Kenny G's horn. This is not going right. in the bowels of the plane. And they give him a call. He's like, look at you. You're going to have to book me on another flight. But this is going in the overhead. Right. They just want to flex, you know, these. Or they just don't understand. And, you know, yeah. I, I get it. Like, you know, it's it's more of an ignorance thing. Yeah. You know, they don't they don't they think, oh, it's a saxophone. I've seen those at Sam Ash or whatever. And just go pick up another saxophone. Yeah, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, you want to break my drumsticks? That's fine. You know, they'll make yeah. me new drumsticks. But you want to break my, you know, fifteen hundred dollars snare drum that's steam bent and whatever? Yeah, I'm gonna have a problem with that. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, well, well, that is great that that you are doing that, and it does. You know, times are changing now that we're songwriters through Spotify. It's even getting worse now that the song, you know, Nashville, one of the songwriting capitals of the world. So all these guys that make a living and pay their mortgage, like putting words and melodies together, um, are complaining about the fractions and fractions of a penny they're making from streaming. Right. So to really still do well as a songwriter, you have to either write a huge theme for a Marvel or, you know, get a really great licensing deal, or you write three chords in the truth for a major, major star that has a terrestrial radio hit. So the, the, the target, it's like playing golf. It's like the target is that big and it's, woo, it's so hard to do. And I feel like some songwriters now are getting a taste of what us sidemen musicians have been experiencing since day one, where it's like, okay, I'm making $400 playing on this song. You're going to make 400,000 as the songwriter. And now I know we signed up for this, but still that seems like a massive chasm, you know? And I don't know what we can do about it. It's just the way that our government sees skill sets, right? Or is it something else? Well, I don't, I don't know about that because the government has nothing to do with, you know, or our the industry that, that we our, set. Yeah. Our industry sees that as a different skill set. Yeah. I don't, you know, the, sadly, you know, you can't copyright a drum groove. I know. Otherwise I mean, Steve Gadd and, would be very, very rich. Yeah. So th those kinds of things, I mean, it's, it's just a fact. So yeah. of all the musicians, you know, we, we, we get the short end of the stick yeah. literally yeah. every time. Um, but, you know, like you said, this is what we chose to do. And, and, you know, you got to find a way. I mean, it's like, like I said, you know, luckily I get to, you know, co-write the theme to the, to the Latin Grammys. I've done yeah. a bunch of jingles and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if you like to write, the opportunities are out there. Yes. Um, you know, and, and it is what we do. I, I've got nothing to complain about. I mean, the music business doesn't owe me anything. I yeah, well, oh, man, you're setting me straight, Lee. You're setting well, me straight right here. Well, 30, 30 years, I mean, as a musician, I, I didn't know the wave was going to go this long. I, you know, I got, yeah. I got nothing to complain about, literally. Well, I love the spirit. I love that. I love that attitude. Um, it does make me bring up this idea of, you know, the union. I'm assuming you and I are union guys. You know, I'm 257. What's Miami? Uh, Lo local six, five five. I, I'm not in the union anymore. You're not actually. in the okay. So this is a story. This is an interesting story because do, do I need you, to do I need to go away? No 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 no, okay. no not not that at all. Because Tennessee is not, a this isn't a union show, is it? 
Ten, no, ten, Tennessee okay. is a right to work state, right? So, so we have a union, and it's and I figured like, okay, so you got to be in the union because they do things like, oh, you can get some health insurance, you can get your instruments insured, and then there's the brotherhood and the sisterhood, and then you know, say you play on a soundtrack and you get paid once, and then it ends up in some you know hotel room in China. So there's the there's the ladies that are watching these things, and then they pay you again. So it's like, okay, that makes sense. And then all the big records that we do on Music Row are usually on the card, and then that allows us to get our special payments fund every payment, everyone in the SAG after payment. So two big checks come a year for us, and I always look forward to those. Yay! I could, I could turn my garage into a drum studio thanks to that check. Um, but then there's all like at my studio here, a lot of it is off the card. I'm never, I'm only going to get paid once, and I'm never going to see a royalty. Um, so I better get paid robustly for this one time. So is that your thought process where it is, it's the wild west. And, and I know that some kids that are just graduating from Belmont, they got an M box and a couple of mics and they're charging a hundred dollars a song. I ain't doing that. You know what I mean? It's right. like, it's gotta be way more than that. And if you, yeah. not just, you gotta be flexible, but I'm not doing it for that amount of money. So, so is that kind of where your thought process is? How do you set your pricing? How does that work? Yeah. Well, I, I call it a race to the bottom and you know, I, I the, I'm not gonna, like, I've been asked to do stuff and, and I'll say, listen, I, I appreciate it. I understand where you're coming from. I realize you have no budget. I said, but I just can't do that for $200. Yeah. Can't no. do it. No. You know, I wish I could, I want to, I used to, but that was 30 years ago. Yeah. Because you know, you're on Sound Better, right? You're on soundbetter.com. You're on airgigs.com. Are you represented on those sites? No. no. Um, no. I, I just assume everybody that's like has a home studio is because like, I'm not on those sites, but I, I look at friends that are on those sites, airgigs.com, soundbetter.com, where you can find a studio musician and you have to put your pricing on there. And that's like, I don't like that. I want to negotiate with the person over the phone in private. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's my, my work comes word of mouth, you know, mostly, and it's, yeah. it's producers, it's songwriters. It's, you know, sometimes it's artists, but usually it's, it's the producer or songwriter, yeah. usually the producer, you know, it's in charge. Sometimes I never meet the artist. I know. And sometimes, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes I don't even know who the artist is. I mean, especially when I'm getting a track, it's got no reference or the reference is the songwriter and, you know, just a guitar. I have no idea. No, if, if nobody tells me who the artist is, you know, or I don't ask, you know, I have no idea. Sometimes people ask me, Hey, did you plan this song? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. I, I you know, could be me. Sound, maybe. Yeah, isn't it really know. funny? Like we're in the Walgreens or something and you're checking out. You're like, Holy sh that's, I think that's me. Yeah. It, it's happened a couple of times. There's a song that I played on. It was, a, it was a, a huge hit and, and that's happened to me. But I, I think more interesting to me is I've never met the producer. He lives in Canada. He hired me. <laughs> right, right. I've played, I've played on a number of things. I actually met the artist once because I went to the artist's show. He was doing a show down here, and, and, and the producer hooked me up to go to see the artist play. So I met the artist, but I never met the producer. We've, we've been working together for 15 years. We've never met each other. Oh, you guys got to make that happen. Well, it's funny because we were playing in Toronto – and I invited him to the show, and he wasn't able to make it that oh. night when we were with Bad Bunny. So we, we came this close to meeting, yeah, but it never happened. Yeah, so there are things like that all the time, and it's it's the the business is so weird, especially now. You know, everyone has their own home studio, and th there are tons of pluses and tons of minuses, and and you have to learn to work within that environment. Um, but, but that's one of them. Is that you know, you I, there's all these people I I work with and work for that I have never met. Wouldn't know him if I passed him on the street. Isn't that nuts? It is crazy because of technology. That technology affords us to do that. And uh, yeah, the name. I goes mean, Nashville's different. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think you guys are really lucky there. Um, you know, unless something's changed, but it seems like there's still a lot of in-person sessions, and you know, four or five guys recording at the same time, and and you know, that's the best way to do it. If everyone is a top-notch player, you know, there's nothing better than that. But, you know, the other side of it, I am so productive here, you know, and ready to go. Like, literally, I, I recorded a song this morning that the producer called me for last night. Nice. 
And he's like, hey, can you get this song done? I'm like, can you wait till Saturday morning? He's like, I have to present it to Sony on Friday afternoon. I said, send it to me. I'll do it in the morning. Nice. So like like 15 minutes before, you know, we hopped on this thing, I was uploading files. Yeah. And I love that you have the Actually, rack because you could just, I, you know, I, I need the vintage I kit. So I'll put the vintage kit on the rack or I have the modern kit and I'll put that on the rack. And obviously I'm staring at like 20 snare drums. You could change those all out pretty quickly. Dude, I forgot to send him a link. Hold on a second. Oh, dude, dude. Literally right working at we're we're working as we're doing the uh this interview. Right Lee now. is doing the thing, man. He's like, hey, check your inbox. It there's the it, link. Exactly. All I right. love it. I love it, man. I, I look so, like I, but yeah. What's that? You go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, no, I was gonna say, yeah, er everything is here. I mean it for me, being able to have I, I can't bring all my stuff, you know. Poor Carlos, who, who we talked about early on, you know, he helps me move my stuff and, you know, he's, he's the best. Um, but there's only so much that, you know, that any one or two people can bring to the studio and he'll bring a bunch of stuff for me and then I'll bring another six snare drums and, but I've got everything here. Yeah. And like you said, with the rack, I mean, this, you know, I, I, I can fit that 28 inch bass drum. I've got a, a you know, this 1951 Gretsch kit up here and i could literally swap out the bass drum keep everything the same or swap out the toms and you know i've got a million symbols and so everything is here it's easy access if if i've got a producer and i have i don't know do you want me to turn this around i can give yeah, you a sure, small tour sure. yeah we got All a right. little tour of the uh you want to do a little tour okay we're gonna we, do a tour. we got a walking okay. tour of lee's okay. studio all right so we're gonna we're gonna come into the uh, so i have a separate control room so i make sure i see so your cat the, Oh, the, the cat's not in here. Oh. Sorry. So, so yeah, so this is the, am I far, far enough back? Oh, that looks great. Yep. So, a lot of pre's. So this is the, con yep. yeah, a lot of pre's. There's, there's no board. Everything is, you know, we're going, you know, just through outboard gear. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of pre's. I'll, I'll, I'll move up. So I'll give you the whole tour if anyone's Beautiful. Interested. Oops, sorry. A lot of flashing so, yeah, lights, folks. Yeah. GML, API, stuff like that. This is not an endorsement. Nobody gives me any of this. I have to buy it. And none of it is cheap. So, yeah. None of it is cheap. So, yeah. So, so all, all this stuff. And so I have a separate room. So if someone wants to bring an engineer or a producer, or, you know, I've had four or five guys in here at, at, at a time, you know, they, they can come here. Yeah. There's Looking a good. You got, with, some, got some platinum records on the wall. Long hair and Bill Clinton. All right. Hanging out with, it's almost like a Forrest Gump moment. You're meeting the president right there. A little bit. Oh, this is, this is one of the best here. This is my wine cool, my wine refrigerator. I got the wine refrigerator. I was going to ask you your, oh. uh, your, your drink of choice after uh, 5 PM. Oh, well, after, before, whatever. Red wine. Did you, yeah. Red wine is my, well, I don't, I don't know if you know, did Carlos ever tell you I'm, I am like, I have a problem. And are you like, a, are you like a sommelier or something or uh? I am. I have, yeah, I have a, I have a level three. No uh, way. The what? Yeah. Wine spirits education trust. I, 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 uh, I have a level three in that. I have a, uh, a Spanish wine scholar, uh, certificate and I'm, I'm currently working on the French wine scholar certificate. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a, I'm a schooled as my wife says, you're an official wine asshole. <laughs> oh my God. So <laughs> this is incredible. So this is a passion of yours, but, but unless you're going to go into it as some sort of a profession, why get the certificate? You hit, already hit on it. Unless oh, you're, you're going to go into it. Okay. So, so many, are we are, are we debuting this information right here on the Rich Redman show? Well, everybody down here kind of knows where my head's at, but uh, I don't I don't know about nationally or internationally. But well, maybe gonna, it's a debut. They're going to know now. So uh, I'll give you I'll give you the quick story of of my wine passion. So. Touring with Julio. Now, now are, you're a wine guy, yes? I do. I, I don't know as much as you, and I have a funny story about it, but you first. Okay. So I'm touring with Julio. I'm 24, 25 years old, something like that. 20, yeah, 24, 25. And periodically, not all the time, he would invite us back on his private jet. Nice. Back to Miami or whatever. Yeah, which was – it didn't happen all the time, but when it happened, it was, it was freaking awesome. We'd finish the show – you know, we'd, we'd hightail it to the airport and, and we'd be home by three in the morning or whatever and climb in bed with my wife and everything was awesome. Nice. Um, on one of those trips, he opened up a bottle of uh, 
uh, Domaine Romani Conti. It was the Pinot Noir. Uh, it was Latash, which, you know, if anybody knows what it is, thousands of dollars, one bottle of wine can yeah. cost with, the, with these. Very rare. And he opened it and he said, okay, kids, this is not Coca-Cola. Do not, do not uh, drink it. Just take a sip and do not go wee-wee before you get home because you need to make love to your wife. Amazing. Like, yeah, I'm like, wow, this is the, the this must be some special wine. I took a taste of it and literally it was like, wow, this is not like anything I've ever had before. You know, of course I grew up, you know, Jewish kids, man, Shev is, you know, it's like this is this was so much better. Um and and I, I didn't understand it, but I immediately knew something was different about this. And with Julio, you can talk about one of three things. It's either wine music or women musically <laughs> wine women you know, and song that's it you know musically you know he, he's great and he does what he does he's the best at what he does but it wasn't really my passion that you know the type of music that it, we were playing it as good as it could be played gotcha. and uh, i mean the band was killer it was all guys from um and friend you know we had we had you know changed the band into something really special so we were really kicking the shit out of that music oh sorry can i say that oh, i can't totally. say that right Fucking okay. A. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. So, you know, so regardless of what anyone thinks about Julio Iglesias, we were, we were fucking killing it. Um, so you could talk about music. You talk about women. I was married. I'm like, what do I, you know, whatever. And then there was wine. So I would start to ask him questions about wine and he would show me stuff. My kid was born. He, he sent me a 1982, which is arguably one of the best years from last century a 1982 magnum of Chateau Petrus, ah. which is, which is probably like 12 or $15,000 now. Whoa. I mean, that's just insanity that he signed. So I kind of got into this thing, talked to him a lot about it. And then at some point my wife was like, you know, if you like it so much, why don't you take some classes? I'm like, that's a good idea. So I took some classes at Le Cordon Bleu. That was, uh, you know, kind of near the house and, and ended up getting a level three Psalm there. And then, re up that with the uh, WSET, which is the Wine Spirits Education Trust. This is where all the other drummers are going to start to sign off of your, uh, your podcast exit. right now. <laughs> yeah, stay, stay. We'll get back to drums, I promise. Um, so, yeah, so I, so I did that recently. And then, you know, but always in the back of my head, not knowing how long the music thing was going to go. And, you know, like I said before, riding that wave is, as far as it'll go. You know, I still love music. I still love playing drums. I don't want to give that up. But always having them in the back of my head, you know, what am I going to do if this stops, when this stops or whatever? Um, so, and, and there's a lot of things I'm passionate about. It could be finance. It could be, you know, wine. It could be lots of different things. So um, I love history. You know, I, I'll find something to do that makes me happy. I, you know, I, I don't want to actually work for a living. I want to do something that I love. Right. So, you know, wine seemed to be like a good thing. So I'm kind of slowly moving in that direction. Wow. And, uh, yeah. So it is a serious passion. Holy cow, man. That is amazing. I, my thing is, is that, um, you know, I enjoy a spirit with friends and, you know, when in Rome, sometimes it's a wine crowd. So I am in this Italian men's group where that we call it, it's Ginzo night. I guess Ginzo is slang for Italian male. So we get together, no women allowed. And over a five, six hour period, we have multiple courses of food and tons of bottles of wine. And so the the key to entry is you have to bring two bottles of very respectable Italian wine. And so here I am. I, they didn't tell me out. They said, bring a couple of bottles of wine. So in my history, I buy $12.99, $19.99 bottles of wine with that have interesting labels you know what i mean it's like so right. so anyways i buy this one that's called tattoo girl it's 13.99 it's girls it's girl covered in tattoos she's cute i was like i bring in these two bottles of wine sit there unopened just collecting dust and then one of the guys pulls me aside and goes hey man it's got to be an italian wine and it should be one of the three b's a barola a barbaresco it's got to be around a 216 or a 219 i finally get it together next time i show up with three fifty dollar bottles of wine they immediately go i knock it out of the ballpark the guy pulls me and goes Good job, kid. You know, so now That's I'm it. learning. I'm learning, you know? Yeah. Because a lot and of people just stay in that boxed wine, $12.99 picnic wine, and they don't really venture out, and it's a whole world. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, 
it's wine making is getting so much better and it's you know it's there's, there's so much about music and wine that are similar to me i mean it, every, like you know you do a session and I never know what I'm going to get. I didn't hear that song that I recorded this morning until this morning. No. So it's the same thing with a winemaker. I mean, think about it. He doesn't know what the weather's going to be. He doesn't know exactly what day he should harvest on. He doesn't know all of these different things. And he's going to get a different wine every time, no matter if he does the exact same thing. It's going to be a different wine. And it's an art with science. And that's, I mean, for drummers, I mean, we're math, we're science, we're all of those things. But with art and when you put those two things together i think that's why wine makes sense to me and why you know it, it, i understand it just because i find them so similar yeah amazing so yeah well congratulations on that like uh, you know i i guess we have a similar story in the sense that and man i got so much weird hate from this but and i have no idea but in my midlife i was like following my divorce at 45 i was like I'm just really interested in this thing that's been calling me. I wanted to study acting, so I studied acting and voiceover and television hosting and improv comedy and just, w just jumped into the deep end of the pool, and it's just been such a fun thing. And it's a real reliable career track, you know, like it's – but I, it was yeah. just a, it was a calling. I just wanted to answer it. You know what I mean? And so when you hear right. that thing in the back of your voice or you, you have that thing in the pit of your stomach, you got to explore it. Now, you also mentioned um, finance. So does that mean like house flipping or like buying rental properties or? No, like I, I listen to the business channel every single morning, the whole the whole stock thing and, and ah. you know, trying to make sure I have enough uh, for my retirement, you know. I, I, I don't want to have to work until I'm 80 years old. I'd, I'd rather, you know, retire and stuff like that. So just keeping up. My dad was an accountant, uh, tax attorney, uh, very, he went to Wharton. I mean, you know, he, Ivy League, the whole nine yards. And, and so I grew up in that environment of talking about business and, and, you know, I'd hear stories about this and, and him selling, you know, a client had a business to sell to a, you know, something, whatever, a big conglomerate. And so I would hear these stories and it, I just I, I I think I understand the language and I get the the whole thing and you know I'm yeah. I'm not a stock trader yeah you know I'm, I'm just, don't it's very sit time there consuming and, you know, yeah yeah and and you know there there are people that paid a lot of money to do that for you so you know I'm, I I don't do that but I enjoy it I you know I, I follow it so yeah. you know I think my dad I, was an I, accountant too man isn't that crazy there you go. There you go. That's my it. Numbers. My dad, yeah, he was an accountant, and my mom was a nurse. So, you know, just hard-working folks, man. That's it. Party yeah. stock. Hey, looking back at this, man, Barbara Streisand, Madonna, Backstreet Boys, Kelly Clark, uh, any, any fave recordings that we people can look up on the discography? Or, you know, I don't know if you've done Muso AI yet. Have you done that? I, I did. Can I tell you something? Somebody had sent me that. Um like months ago like hey you should check this out and i you know i kind of i kept the email like yeah. but you know I, j I didn't look at it at the time and then i got an ad from them or something like that you know just a way of sending out stuff i don't know if it was my email address or whatever and i got an advertisement i'm like oh that's that thing that somebody sent me i should look at that so i i, I signed up for the week free trial dude billions it, of streams it, it, right 16 billion it blew my mind nice. like nice. i i i have no idea like i i'm here in my cave and i don't i don't really think about that and and i i don't know i don't know where it is this week but but it's i mean if if nobody's checked that out or I, if no i'm pulling up the app recording, yeah, i'm sure you're ahead of me i'm i'm in the top one percent drummers on the in the world and you have been on more recordings than me so we're probably I'm doing good here. Drummers. I'm bringing it up. Right now, the first drummers in the world right now are Jerry Rowe, Aaron Sterling, Chris McHugh, Near Z, all uh, Nashville guys. You got your Victor and Drizzo's. My, I'm about to interview Evan Hutchings. He's a Nashville guy, Matt Chamberlain. There you are, buddy. You're number 13 right now. Of lucky, top, lucky 13. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're top 13. Let me see if I made the top 100 this week. It's just interesting, you know, to look and be uh, in the – yeah. yeah. In, I mean, the, the thing that blew me away, like, cause I mean, maybe because I'm, I'm not a Latino, I don't really think about how much stuff that I play on gets played and, and how many times it gets played and, and who follows that and stuff like that. So it, like, I feel like I've been in this 
it been in the music business, but in another side of the music business that that you know we didn't grow up with. Right. People people in other countries grew up with, and you know I, I don't think about it. And then when I when I signed up on that thing and I saw that, I was like, "Just this is insane." It's great. You know, it's, it's just it's just not what I think about. Twelve hundred credits you have on there, buddy. So that's a lot of recordings. Just think about it, and that could be albums and or songs. Well, and at, at for the fir- I'd say for the first twenty years, it was probably mostly albums. Yeah. Now things have turned into songs. You know what so, I mean? You'll have five producers on an album, and each one's got their team and and whatever. So I may play on one or two, um, but very rarely are there full albums now. Awesome, man. Well, I so, encourage everybody to check out uh, LeeLevin.com. Cool website. And what would be the advice you gave to somebody that is starting out, that wants to do this thing? They could be a drummer or just a musician approaching the music business, but something tells me it's going to come down to one or two strong words, strong phrases. It's not as much about your talent as it is about being a people person. Nice. And... I can't tell you how many, I mean, I remember Hiram Bullock coming to the University of Miami when I was still going there and someone said, hey, well, how, you know, how, why do you get called for so many sessions? He's like, man, you know, rest in peace, Hiram. Like, man, I am not the greatest guitar player in the world. That's for sure. He says, but people want to hang out with me because I'm funny <laughs> and I, I'm at a session and people have a good time. And it was more about the hang yeah. than it was about. He's put now, of course, he was an amazing guitar player, and you know, no one's gonna doubt that. But but there's something about people need to understand, and it's all business. It doesn't matter if it's music or whatever, it's still a people business. We are providing a service for whoever's hiring us. It could be the artist, it could be the songwriter, it could be the producer, whatever. It's our job to make them comfortable to make their product the best thing that it can be. It's not about me, it's not about what I do. It's about how do I support what this person is doing? And the reason that people get called back is because the person that leaves the studio or whatever it is, is satisfied. You don't give them a reason to look elsewhere. Right. Because they'll find somebody. There's a million guys that do what we do, Mm -hmm. you know, and a million guys that'll do it, like you said, for a hundred bucks. And they're probably great. Don't give them a reason to find that guy. Once you, once you have your clientele, just always do a great job. I don't care if I'm playing on it for free and it's you know something for a, for a charity or whatever. It is always the most important thing that I'm doing, and it's at that moment. And you have to be fully engaged, and you have to make the person understand that when, when I'm playing a song, I pretend and feel like this is my song. That's how important it is to me. And that's the way I play it. And unless you're doing that, you're not giving a hundred percent. I love that. I, I, pers- I pretend I'm the lead singer. What would, what would the lead singer want from this from, from his drummer? That is great advice. So the idea of constantly and consistently exceeding expectations and, and, and really being in the moment and, and we're in a service industry and it's a people business, man, that is great advice. Hey, how about the fast five? And it's not usually fast, but we'll call it the fave five. Um, favorite, uh, color. Favorite color, uh, blue. All right. I get, been getting a lot of blues. Um, I know that I know the answer to this favorite drink. Uh, do you want a specific one? Yeah, give me—is it like? Uh, get, yeah, the maker. Uh, well, I would, I, I would zero in on Left Bank Bordeaux, uh, Chateau du Cru Bocayou. Probably might be my my first. Uh, it's difficult to say. So yeah, um, but yeah, definitely it, Left Bank Bordeaux. Is it approachable? Like, is it affordable? Can you have a couple a year, or is it a very celebratory once in a couple of lifetimes? On my salary, it's a uh, celebratory, but you know, it's yeah. they they do make a second wine and a third wine that are also very good. Oh, nice. Um, okay. But yeah. How about a dish or favorite type of food or dish? Oh man, I I love pizza. I try not to eat it because you know it's not good for you. Yeah. But man, I love it. I mean, Me there's too. a I have a couple like like you know, get stuck on an island. What things would I want? You know, ice cream would be one. Pizza, you know, because if you're stuck on an island, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like and how yeah. fat you get. You know, whatever. You're not there to impress anybody. <laughs> I rained on some vegan pizza, uh, some vegan uh, ice cream last night. That was great. Um, this is a uh, very difficult for a lot of people, but 
there's a song that keeps coming up into your in your life it haunts you it's it you can't escape it you love the melody you love the band you love the drummer what would be a favorite song oh man um i have so many favorite songs that's that's an unfair question because it is so unfair yeah there's there is a song um let me make sure i get the right title it's a mark cohen song there's no drums on it whatsoever this has been very I common mean, for drummers saying that they enjoy songs that have no drums well you know the the thing is it, again like i told you i love just songs and and the fact that somebody can write something that is so moving things we've handed down it's the last song on the rainy season album and it wow. will make me cry every freaking time i hear it it reminds me of my dad it reminds me of my family it just it's and it's not anything like personally reminds you it's just it's just got this vibe to it that that um you know plus ever since i had a kid you have kids no i never did it no kids ever since i had a kid i'll cry at a freaking Publix commercial whatever like i am the the biggest baby me too my man. wife will make fun of me she's like you crying and like i could watch a movie 20 times i'll cry every time at the place where you're supposed to cry totally uh yeah yeah so i'm i'm just a big baby but that song in particular like i've sat on a plane like with these you know noise canceling headphones and been like yeah well know, that means you're, right, emotion you're you're emotionally engaged man you, you're, you know, you're i'm i'm a sensitive fellow I am a sensitive fellow as well. And that speaks to like one of my favorite films, Shawshank Redemption, where he's walking down the oh, beach yeah. and then teardrops. Do you have a favorite movie? I have a couple. Yeah, um, that's, that's all right. Yeah. Chef. I love, love it with Chef. Favreau. That, and again, it's a father son sort of thing. Yeah. You know, I, I, and it's just, it, it has to do with art, you know, and his, passion and and those things like i love that i love amadeus the movie about mozart from you know from way back when there you go. There you go. I, th I think that's a, a brilliant movie um i love the fifth element okay you know so i'll i'll go all over the place like i i have some favorites um but yeah those those three pop into my head as as being you know favorite movies chef is one that you can watch over and over and leguizamo's great in it and the kid's great and yeah Really good. Actually, Leguizamo was at the last Grammys we did, the Latin Grammys we did in Spain. He was sitting right in front of me. Uh, he was in the audience. He was on the show and like literally sitting there while we were playing one of the acts and he was so into it. He was just going crazy. I loved it. Uh, dude, I love I love it when you play those shows and you're looking at the front row and like I'm looking at the front row like years ago we were debuting the song Hicktown on the ACMs and it was like drop D tuning and I'm riding crashes. We're breaking all the rules and I'm looking down there and there's like Reba and you know Tim McGraw right. and Reba's like, you know, like plugging her ears. Hilarious. This is music now. <laughs> Amazing, man. It is crazy. Well, it's been awesome to spend this time with you, man. Everybody check out Lee Levin. It's L E V I N dot com. I hope we can connect in the flesh soon, man. And uh, it's just awesome to spend this time with you, man. And to all the listeners, thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe. New episode drops every Friday. Subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the podcast. And uh, until next time, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Talk right, to you soon. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.